Apollo 11 is man's first attempt to demonstrate the ability to go to the moon, to land there, and to return to Earth. Literally within seconds, we have communications problems, and that's the one thing we need in order to go down to the surface of the moon. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Three, two, one, zero, liftoff. What if Neil Armstrong's moon landing isn't the whole story? I used to be sure it happened, but now I have my doubts. Did they really walk on the moon? Or is there a big secret they're keeping from us? Imagine the whole world fooled by a hidden truth on that silent, distant moon. What shocking secret could Armstrong have found up there? Let's uncover what they might be hiding for so long. Armstrong's Untold Journey Neil Armstrong grew up near the hometown of the Wright brothers. Even as a child, he was fascinated by the sky, and it seemed like his destiny was to reach the stars. His life as a NASA astronaut was full of daring missions and incredible achievements, showing that he was meant for something extraordinary. But what did Armstrong really find when he stepped on the moon? Let's dive into what Armstrong might have discovered during his lunar journey. The phrase, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind, is unforgettable. Armstrong is celebrated as a key figure in American space exploration, the first person to walk on the moon. However, before he died, he left behind a mysterious hint, suggesting there was more to his journey. Joe Rogan, a well-known podcaster, believes he has figured out what Armstrong was hinting at. But what exactly has Rogan uncovered about lunar travel? Let's explore Rogan's thoughts on Armstrong's hidden message. Neil Armstrong was born on August 5, 1930, near where the Wright brothers first tested flight. His family had diverse European roots, and Neil had a younger sister named June and a brother named Dean. His father's job as a state auditor meant they moved a lot, 16 times in 14 years helping young Neil become adaptable and resilient. His love for flying started early. When he was just two, his father took him to the Cleveland Air Races. By the time he was five or six, he had his first airplane ride, sparking a lifelong passion for the skies. At 16, Neil got his pilot's license, even before he could legally drive a car. In 1947, he attended Purdue University on a Navy scholarship studying aeronautical engineering. His college years were interrupted by the Korean War, where he flew 78 combat missions as a jet fighter pilot, showing his bravery and skill early on. After finishing his studies, he joined the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which later became NASA. Neil's reputation as a calm and skilled test pilot grew at NASA's Flight Research Center, which is now named after him. While stationed at Edwards Air Force Base in California, he flew over 200 different types of aircraft, pushing each to its limits. One of these was the X-15, which he piloted to the edge of space, reaching speeds over 4,000 miles per hour. Armstrong's skills as a test pilot were crucial to NASA's early successes, leading to his selection for astronaut training in Houston in 1962. But during this time, tragedy struck when his daughter, Karen, died from an untreatable brain tumor. This personal loss deepened his commitment to his work, particularly focusing on the Gemini program, which was NASA's early step towards the moon. In 1966, Armstrong led the Gemini 8 mission, which achieved the first successful docking of two spacecraft in orbit. This was a vital step for future moon missions. His experiences during these missions prepared him for what would become his historic journey to the moon. Next, we explore how Neil Armstrong's space adventures prepared him for his moon mission. The day space spun out of control. Neil Armstrong and his co-pilot, David Scott, found themselves in a tricky and dangerous situation when they successfully connected their spacecraft to an unmanned vehicle in space. But soon after, their spacecraft started to spin out of control because of a faulty thruster. Armstrong acted quickly, using the re-entry control system to stop the spinning and stabilize the craft. Even though he managed to get the situation under control, they had to cut their mission short and make an emergency landing in the Pacific Ocean. 
This close call really showed Armstrong's ability to stay calm and act fast when things go wrong. But this wasn't the most famous mission of Armstrong's career. That would come later, on a mission that would forever seal his place in history. Armstrong was chosen to lead Apollo 11, the first manned mission to the moon. This makes us wonder, how did humans actually manage to travel to the moon? What challenges did they face in space? And what dangers were waiting for them? The journey to the moon was nothing less than extraordinary. The original crew chosen for this incredible mission included Commander Neil Armstrong, Command Module Pilot Jim Lovell, and Lunar Module Pilot Buzz Aldrin. They had been the backup crew for Apollo 9. Lovell and Aldrin had flown together before on the Gemini 12 mission, but delays in the design and production of the Lunar Module caused some changes in crew assignments for Apollo 8 and Apollo 9. This put Armstrong's team as the standby for Apollo 8. According to NASA's usual rotation of crews, it was expected that Armstrong would lead Apollo 11, setting the stage for one of humanity's greatest achievements. Armstrong's journey to becoming the first person to walk on the moon started here. The three men of Apollo 11 weren't close friends, but they developed a respectful and professional relationship. Things changed when Michael Collins, who was originally supposed to be the command module pilot for Apollo 8, had to have back surgery. Jim Lovell took his place during that time. After Collins recovered, he rejoined the crew for Apollo 11. During these shifts, Fred Hayes temporarily stepped in as the backup lunar module pilot, and Buzz Aldrin became the backup command module pilot for Apollo 8. For the second time in American space history, a mission was manned entirely by experienced astronauts. The first was Apollo 10, and the next wouldn't be until STS-26 in 1988. Deke Slayton, one of the leaders, offered Armstrong the chance to replace Aldrin with Lovell, since some people found Aldrin hard to work with. Armstrong, not having any personal issues with Aldrin, thought about it for a day before deciding to keep the team as it was. He believed Lovell deserved to command his own mission in the future. However, the Apollo 11 crew wasn't as close-knit as the Apollo 12 team. They maintained a professional relationship, but not a personal one. Collins and Aldrin saw their connection as polite but distant, more like friendly co-workers than close companions. Armstrong, on the other hand, believed that his teams always worked well together. On July 16, 1969, the world held its breath as the Saturn V rocket launched from Florida, with millions of people watching on TV. But this was only the beginning of their incredible journey. Four days after the launch, Armstrong and Aldrin moved from the command module, now named Columbia, into the lunar module, which they called Eagle. They were preparing for the historic landing on the moon. At exactly 1744, Eagle separated from Columbia, leaving Collins alone to manage the command module. Collins kept a close eye on Eagle to make sure it wasn't damaged and that its landing gear was properly set up. Armstrong jokingly said that Eagle now really had its wings, signaling the start of their descent to the moon's surface. Now, Armstrong and Aldrin face new hurdles as they approach the moon's surface. The Unexpected Challenges of Apollo 11's landing. As Armstrong and Aldrin were making their way down to the moon's surface, they noticed something unusual. They were flying over the moon's landmarks faster than they had expected. This meant they were ahead of schedule by a few seconds, which could cause them to land farther west than they had planned. Even a few seconds off could mean missing their landing zone by several miles, which might put them in an unintended area. One possible reason for this could have been gravitational anomalies on the moon. These areas, known as mascons, have a denser mass that could have pulled their spacecraft Eagle off course. Gene Kranz, the mission's flight director, thought the shift might also have been caused by extra air pressure in the docking tunnel or the spacecraft rotating just after they started descending. When they were about 6,000 feet above the lunar surface, more problems popped up. The onboard computer started flashing warning codes 1201 and 1202, 
indicating that it was overloaded and struggling to keep up with its tasks. Back on Earth, Jack Garman, a computer specialist at Mission Control, quickly evaluated the situation. He confirmed that, despite the computer's issues, they could continue their descent safely. He passed this information to Steve Bales, the guidance officer, who then reassured the astronauts. Just as Armstrong was dealing with the computer issues, he noticed another problem. The automated systems were guiding them toward a dangerous landing spot filled with large rocks and right next to a big crater called West Crater. Armstrong decided to take manual control to avoid this risky area. He thought about landing near the rocks to collect some unique samples but gave up on the idea because they were moving too fast. Buzz Aldrin, the co-pilot, kept an eye on their speed and direction while Armstrong maneuvered the Eagle closer to the surface. At only 107 feet above the ground, Armstrong realized they were running low on fuel and needed to find a safe spot to land quickly. At about 250 feet up, he spotted a flatter area but had to avoid another crater. Finally, he found a good place to land, just 100 feet below them. With only 90 seconds of fuel left, dust from the moon started to cloud their view, making it hard to judge their speed. Armstrong could still see large rocks through the dust and used them to estimate how fast they were going. When a sensor rod touched the moon's surface, a warning light came on, signaling Aldrin to announce that they were about to land. Armstrong was supposed to turn off the engine right away to avoid the exhaust causing problems on the lunar surface. However, in the heat of the moment, he hesitated for three seconds before safely shutting it down. But the challenges didn't end there. Once they were safely on the moon, they faced the task of broadcasting this historic moment back to Earth. The technology used for Apollo 11's broadcast was not compatible with regular home TVs. The original footage was shown on a special monitor, which was then filmed by another camera, creating a video of a video. This resulted in a less clear image. The signal first reached Earth at Goldstone in the US, but soon after, a clearer signal was picked up by the Honeysuckle Creek Tracking Station in Australia. They eventually switched to the Parks Radio Telescope in Australia, which provided even better quality despite some technical difficulties and bad weather. This black and white footage of the astronauts' first steps on the moon was seen by over 600 million people worldwide, and copies of the broadcast were saved to keep the clarity of those historic moments. After their moon landing, the astronauts come home to cheers and whispers of doubt. The Lost Moon Landing Tapes The original video from the moon was erased because NASA needed the tapes for other missions. When the astronauts returned to Earth, their spacecraft, Columbia, landed in the ocean but ended up upside down. Thankfully, within 10 minutes, they managed to turn it right side up with the help of airbags. A Navy diver, lowered from a helicopter, attached an anchor to keep the capsule from drifting away. Other divers added more buoyancy aids to stabilize the capsule and set up rafts to help the astronauts exit. On August 13th, the astronauts were welcomed back with parades in New York and Chicago, with around 6 million people showing up to celebrate. That night, they were honored at a grand dinner in Los Angeles, attended by important figures including members of Congress, 44 state governors, two chief justices, and ambassadors from 83 countries at the Century Plaza Hotel. President Nixon and Vice President Agnew awarded each astronaut the Presidential Medal of Freedom. But the celebrations didn't end there. On September 16, 1969, the astronauts addressed both chambers of Congress and presented American flags that had traveled with them to the moon. The flag from American Samoa that went to the moon now resides in a museum in Pago Pago, the capital of American Samoa. This was just the start of a 38-day international tour across 22 countries, where they met leaders and shared their experiences. They started in Mexico City and ended in Tokyo, visiting major cities like Bogota, Buenos Aires, Rio de Janeiro, and many European capitals such as Madrid, Paris, and London. Their journey continued through Africa, Australia, and several Asian cities, spreading the excitement of their lunar mission around the world. But this wasn't the end of the story. Joe Rogan, a well-known podcaster,
has often expressed doubts about the moon landing. He points to things like the movement of the U.S. flag, which seemed to flutter even though there's no wind on the moon. This has led him and others to suggest that the flag might have been rigged with a wire frame or even a fan, making them think the landing could have been faked on Earth. They argue that NASA might have created this elaborate hoax to prove U.S. dominance in the space race against the Soviet Union. Questions continue about the authenticity of NASA's photos from the moon, especially why no stars are visible in the background, which some people believe should be there given the moon's location in space. One famous photo shows Buzz Aldrin with Neil Armstrong reflected in Aldrin's visor, but Armstrong isn't holding a camera raising doubts about who took the photo. Since only Armstrong and Aldrin were supposed to be on the moon, this has fueled more speculation. Adding to the controversy, a former Rocketdyne employee who worked on the Saturn V rocket claimed to have inside knowledge that the landing was fake, pointing to the flag as just one of many staged elements. This ongoing skepticism has led some to believe that Armstrong left NASA because he couldn't handle the guilt of being part of a hoax. At NASA, astronauts like Glenn and Harrison Schmidt from Apollo 17 later moved into political careers. Neil Armstrong was also approached by both major political parties to join them, but he chose not to, staying true to his personal beliefs. He thought the United States should not force its ideas on other countries and strongly supported the rights of individual states. In the 1950s, Armstrong decided to lead a Boy Scout troop at his church as a way to express his faith. This choice surprised his very religious mother. After his return from the moon, Armstrong showed his respect for the U.S. Congress, subtly hinting at his amazement at the universe and his belief in a higher power. Back on Earth, Armstrong's life continues to inspire and stir curiosity, from moon landing to Islamic chants. In the early 1980s, a rumor started that Neil Armstrong had converted to Islam because some believed he heard the Islamic call to prayer while on the moon. An Indonesian singer even created a song about this supposed event, which became popular in Jakarta in 1983. Similar stories surfaced in Egypt and Malaysia leading the U.S. government to officially clarify in March 1983 through their embassies in Muslim countries that Armstrong had not converted. This rumor lingered for almost 30 years, partly because Armstrong lived in Lebanon, Ohio, a place with the same name as a mostly Muslim country. But that wasn't the most surprising part of Armstrong's life. His love for flying was incredibly strong, especially for flying gliders. Even before his famous moon mission, the International Gliding Commission recognized his passion. He continued flying well into his 70s. In November 1978, while working on his farm, Armstrong had an accident that severed the tip of his finger, but doctors were able to reattach it. In 1991, he had a mild heart attack while skiing. Sadly, after heart surgery in 2012, he faced complications and passed away on August 25th at age 82. President Barack Obama honored Armstrong, calling him a hero for all generations. Armstrong's lasting legacy was to inspire people to dream big, to strive for more, and to serve greater causes. His family encouraged people to remember him by looking at the moon and giving a playful wink. Armstrong's fellow Apollo 11 astronauts, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins, expressed their deep respect and admiration for him. NASA Administrator Charles Bolden stated that Armstrong's importance in history would last as long as history itself is remembered. But Armstrong's impact reached beyond space exploration. He was honored by being inducted into various halls of fame and recognized by many institutions. For instance, Purdue University named an engineering building after him, and NASA renamed a flight research center in his honor. The U.S. Navy also named a new class of research ships after him, further celebrating his contributions. Could the moon landing have been a sophisticated hoax? What do you think? Let's hear your thoughts below. Don't forget to like, leave a comment, and subscribe.